All right, so we are continuing this series called Lord Have Mercy. And in this series, if you missed any of it, you can go back and, and catch our website. Uh, all of our messages are on there. Our app, you can download it to any smartphone or mobile device. Get caught up on anything that you might have missed. But uh, the premise of this series is for us to uh, have a, a, an understanding or a greater awareness of the mercies of God and how they apply in our lives uh, beyond just knowing the mercies of God, but what it means for us in our lives and how we can um, in growing in our understanding of those mercies, how we can apply them in our lives, how it changes our lives in growing in this understanding. Because if all we're doing is just uh, gathering a whole bunch of information and, and gaining insight and knowledge about something, but it never transforms our lives, then really we're wasting our time. And, and we're not doing anything that's going to be applicable in our lives outside of just getting a bunch of knowledge. And I don't believe that's the purpose of the instruction as you go in here and you read and you see and what it means to have a, a transformed life and, and what the outcome of that is. And so the hope is that as we grow in these understandings of the mercies of God, that we see how they apply in our lives and that our lives do become transformed. And so uh, we started at the very beginning talking about how we receive the mercies of God and it's by the mercy of God. And we, we reference the passage in Titus where Paul says that it is not according to our works, not according to our deeds that we could ever hope to do in righteousness, but according to his mercy that he saved us. And then from there, we've looked at different elements and different mercies of God. Last week, we talked about being crucified being circumcised, and that our debt was canceled. And today we're going to kind of build off of that in a couple of ways. And it's important for us to know and understand the fullness of that because if we can know and understand that we have been crucified, that our old self's done away, if we know and, and realize what happened when we were circumcised, if we come to the understanding and the, the realization and consider ourselves to have been cleared free from the debt that we owed, then it can lead into a transformed life. And today we're going to be talking about confidence. And I, I want to look at something that Jimmy Carter, uh, one of our um, former presidents, he was given a State of the Union address. And in that, he made some of these comments. And I want to read it, and I think it's enlightening to us in a couple of different ways. But here's what he said. It's clear that the true problems of our nation are much deeper than gasoline lines, energy shortages, inflation or recession. It's funny how the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? I mean, we're still talking about the same stuff. Uh, he says, but I want to speak to you tonight about a subject even more serious than energy or inflation. I want to talk to you right now about a fundamental threat to America. I do not mean our political and civil liberties, though they will endure. I do not refer to the outward strength of America, a nation that is at peace tonight everywhere in the world. The threat is nearly invisible in ordinary ways. It is a crisis of confidence. It's a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. We see this crisis in the growing doubt about the meaning of our lives and in the loss of a unity of purpose for our nation. He says, what we've done is we're, we're talking about all these external things and these things that are on the surface that, that we're upset about and we want change in and we're all this stuff. He said, but it's deeper than that. It's more than just what's on the outside. It's more than just the external outcomes of something much deeper. And he says, it flows from a crisis of confidence. The same is true in our faith. And this is what I mean, where we look at the externals in our life. We look at the things on the outside, the circumstances we find ourselves in, the situations uh, that we find ourselves in, the effects of some decisions that we've made. We look at those things and those circumstances, those external factors affect our confidence. And it flows out of a lack of confidence. And we're going to look at two elements of our confidence today. One is we're going to look at our confidence that we have to overcome some of those things that we allow ourselves to give into that create destruction and chaos and, and death in our lives. And then we're going to look at the confidence that we have to come to God in the event that we do give in to some of those temptations and our weaknesses. 
And I want to start in a passage in Romans 6. So if you've got your Bible, you can open up to Romans 6. There's so much in this passage that if you can grasp it and you can receive it and believe it and stand on it, this is where the power is. So if you've got your Bible open up to Romans 6, if you've got an app, open that up, get to Romans 6, mark this, spend some time in here this week. If you don't have any of those, we got you covered here on the screen. I'm a big proponent of the physical Bible, reading it, listening to it. I believe it ingrains it a little more. And I feel like that sometimes I'm enabling you to not bring your Bible by having it on the screen, but that's your business. That's another conversation another day. All right, but it will be on the screen. Here we go. Romans 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves, then you present, them at, for, uh, you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, last week your debt was canceled. You've been set free. You became obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were committed. Having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And I'm speaking in human terms because of the weaknesses of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves... You were slaves of sin. You were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification. And the outcome is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Summarizing that passage, there's a lot there. You spend a lot of time on that if you desire throughout the course of this week really meditate on that. But summarizing that, you're no longer slaves to sin. That you have been set free from the power of sin and death in your life. That prior to coming into relationship with God through Christ, that You were slaves to sin. It had power over you. You had no way to overcome sin in your life. But now you're no longer slaves to sin, which means you don't have to give in to the temptations. And we all have different weaknesses and different temptations that we're more prone to give into. And as we talked last week about circumcision and and we, we, we made the analogy that's the obvious analogy that they're using is that the physical circumcision where there's a layer of flesh that's cut away and, and discarded and that flesh dies and it's no longer useful anymore. How silly would it be for us to try to keep that piece of flesh around in case we needed it later in life? It's silly, right? Well, that's what happens to us when, when we are spiritually circumcised. The flesh, the, the, the power in our lives that drove us, that enslaved us, that forced us to give in to sin, that flesh was done away with. It was dead. It's no more. And so you've you've got the the old flesh there that's dead, that's done away with, but now you've got this new creation that you are. Well, just like a physical circumcision, there's going to be scars and effects and evidences that a circumcision has taken place. You think about it. There's an incision. There's a a, a, a scab that, that forms and there's healing that takes place and there's this process of, uh, of completely doing away with the effects and the evidences of the circumcision. Same thing when we come into our new life. When we are made into a new creation and we are circumcised and the old is done away with, there are effects and evidences and, and residue of the flesh still in our lives. There are things that we give into. There are things that we have um, that, that were who we were, that defined who we are, that maybe some of the decisions that we made caused an effect to happen in our life that still carries with us into this new life in Christ that we have. But we also have those same temptations in our life. Those temptations don't go away. 
the, the weaknesses that we have, the struggles that we have, those don't change. And you think the enemy's just going to give up on you just because you put your faith in Christ? Like, oh, well, I lost that one. Let me move on to somebody else. No, he's going to continue to try to take you out. And I don't believe that Satan is om omnipresent. I don't read anywhere where it's clear and evident that Satan is everywhere all at once. But I do see where he has powers and principalities and evil forces working for him in our world all throughout. And I do believe that they don't know our thoughts in our mind, but they do know people. And as the evil forces and the enemy is working against us, they're watching us. And the temptations that they throw in front of us, they see how we linger a little long in the look. How we maybe make a passing touch that lingers a little long. And how we say something to somebody in the tone that we use. And so whatever it is that we struggle with, whatever temptations that we're prone to give into, so often those get reinforced in our life and they get enhanced and they get, there's kind of a bombardment of those temptations. Any of you ever realized why you never get tempted with certain things, but the things that you seem to always give into, it seems like it's always in front of you? And the, the interesting thing is we all have different weaknesses and different things that we may at times give into. And the unfortunate reality is that so often that somebody else's weaknesses and temptations are worse than ours. Because I can understand somebody that struggles with the same thing I struggle with, but I don't understand when somebody struggles with something I don't struggle with. So I yell and scream and rail against somebody else's struggles and weaknesses and when they give in to something that I don't, and I, I'm a lot louder about that than something that somebody I struggle, struggles with the same thing I do, and I can say, well, I understand that. I get that. A little more grace and understanding. But it's all the same. It's all under the same umbrella of temptation of the lusts of our eyes, the, the things that we see that we covet, the things that we look at that we want, the lusts of our flesh, the, desire, the physical desires that we have, or the pride of life, thinking we're something that we're righteous in and of ourselves because of what we know or who we know or who we think we are. It's all the same. John ties it all up. He says it, it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The enemy has no new schemes and no new tricks of the trade. It's all the same since the beginning of time. But what he wants to do is plant those seeds of doubt in your mind. And when you think... I can't overcome whatever it is that's going on. Because we say that, don't we? And I, I'm, I've probably been guilty of this in the past, and maybe you found yourself saying this, or in conversations that you've had, you've heard people say this, and if it's you, I want to encourage you to stop. If it's not you and somebody's talking to you, I want to encourage you to speak truth in their life. Because how many of you either said or heard somebody say, well, I just can't help myself. Or that's just who I am. Right, And so we continue to give in. And Paul says a little bit further up in Romans 6, prior to that passage we just read, he says, do not let sin reign in your bodies. So there's a choice that we have to make to give into it and to allow it to reign in our bodies. He says, don't let it. And then a little bit before that, in Romans 6, verse 11, he says, consider yourself dead to sin. Reckon, may, your, your passage, your version may say, reckon yourself dead to sin. That means know it and own it. Be able to walk in the truth of it. But the enemy wants to plant those seeds of doubt and destroy our confidence in the truth and the reality that we are dead to the power of sin in our lives. That we don't have to give in to it. But then it goes beyond that because we've all found ourselves giving into it, haven't we? I mean, at times we give in to whatever it is that we're prone to give in to, whatever weaknesses that we have, we give in. And then the enemy wants to come in and plant seeds of doubt in your mind that 
you could ever take that before God. Right? He wants to destroy your confidence and your ability to come before God with whatever it is that you have and whatever it is that you're struggling with. Look at Ephesians 3, 11 and 12. I want to clear something up for some of you. Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through him in faith. Now, who's it through? Or through faith in him. Same thing either way. Through faith in him. We have boldness and confident access. Boldness, meaning I'm not going to be bashful or, or scared or ashamed to come before him. And confident access, meaning I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I can come to him. I can come to the Father through Jesus. But the enemy wants to say, no, 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 no. Do you realize what you've been doing? Like you realize what you find yourself in the middle of? You, you think you can just bring that to God? And just sight unseen, like no big deal. Like you're just going to come to God with all that mess. After all the stuff you've done, all the destruction you've caused, all the chaos in your life, you're just going to bring that to God and say, here God, now look what I've done. No, 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 no. He ain't trying to hear all that. So go get yourself cleaned up, go get yourself fixed, and then you can go to God. That's the enemy talking to your mind, right? That's what he tries to tell you. As if there's something you can bring to the table to clean yourself up enough to present yourself to God in any way, shape, or form. As if any of this is about you. Look at what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He talks about where his confidence is. This is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Here it is. Not that we're adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy of, is from God. Paul says, here's where my confidence is, is that this is not about me. That my adequacy, my sufficiency, my ability to, to get out of the mess, to, to walk through the mess, to overcome the mess, to not give in to temptation, whatever it is, my adequacy isn't in and of myself. My adequacy is in God and what he has to say and not what the enemy lies to me about what he wants me to hear. Think about it this way. If you're a parent, you've got kids, or if you're a kid, y'all probably don't have, have kids yet. You've got parents, right? Okay. Yeah. If you've got parents or if you have kids and you're a kid and you go to your parent or you're, one of your kids comes to you and they say, mom, dad, like I, I've got this mess I found myself in. Like, I, I've caused all this destruction and, and these problems in my life and uh, I, I've given in to the temptation of sin and I, I, just, I don't know what to do. Right? I've tried to fix it. I've tried to clean all this stuff up and I've tried to, to, to get myself right and I just cr keep creating more problems in my life and I don't know what else to do and I need some help. I'm asking you for help. Now, if you're a parent, how many of you would stand there and look at your kid in the eye how many of you would go to your parent and expect them to look at you in the eye and say, that's all good, but you know what? You go finish cleaning yourself up and then come back and we'll talk about how I can help you. Now, does that not sound preposterous to you? Like if any of you have ever said that to your kid, then send your kid to me. But it's ridiculous to envision that if your child was coming to you and asking for help because they've created all this chaos and you've watched it, right? I mean, you've seen them walk through messes. You've seen them create destruction and despair in your life. And you've been there all along to help them. And, and, and all they keep doing is making one bad decision after another bad decision after another. And their whole life is crumbling around them. And they finally come to you and they say, I can't do it anymore. Like, I, I need some help. And for you to say, no, go get your stuff cleaned up and then come back. Not only would you not do that, how much better, how much more loving, how much greater is our heavenly father than we could ever be for our children? And that's not how you came into relationship with him. And how unreasonable would it be for God to expect us to live our lives in a way differently than how we came into relationship with him. 
parents, your children were born into your family. Now, what would they need to do in their lives to be more a part of the family or to change their status and their structure? No, they're your family because they were born. You could disown them. You, you could say, I don't want anything else to do with you. It doesn't change the fact that they're your children. The father doesn't ask anything differently of us than how we came into relationship with him. Look what he says in Colossians 2. Therefore, as you have received Christ the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Now, how did you receive Christ? By grace, through faith, not according to your works, not by works of righteousness that you did, but by his mercy. That's how you received him. And if we are to walk in the same way that we received him, then how are we to walk? Walk by grace, through faith, in him. Not walk according to our works. Not walk according to our righteousness, but according to his mercy. As you receive him, so walk in him. God doesn't ask anything different of us for salvation than he does for life. Some of you have been told that, okay, you're saved by grace, but now you've got to live by works in order to keep up some righteousness or keep up in good standing with God or stay in a certain path with God. That's not true. As you received him by grace through faith, so walk in him. Not according to your works of righteousness, but according to his mercy. And how does all this play out in our lives? Like, what does this look like? Where's the, where's the source of the externals? That's what we're talking about, right? Because we let the externals shake our confidence. And so often we want to know, okay, how do we bear the fruit? How do our lives look like a new creation? Where does the rubber meet the road? That's what we want to know. Because Paul says this in Ephesians 4, that in reference to your former manner of life, right, the, the flesh that was circumcised and done away with, lay it aside, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Because what, what, what do we so often do? We talked about this last week. We, circ we, we understand we're circumcised. God circumcises, takes the old self, the flesh, and does away with it, discards it. What does it do? It dies. You lay aside the old self. It, the old self is dead. It, it, it dies. But what do we want to do? Little by little, we, we, we start to pick up the old self, that old dead flesh. We want to cover ourselves with it and walk around with it. And all it does is create destruction and death in our lives. Paul says, lay that aside. Set it aside. Stop trying to bring up something that's dead. Because it's just creating more destruction in your life. Set it aside. And so in our lives, whatever it is that we struggle with, whatever those temptations are, whatever those old habits, the, the residue of the flesh that's in our lives that, that we have a tendency to give into, whatever those are, set it aside. If you struggle with alcohol and you can't control yourself or, 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 or any kind of um, self-control when, when you start to drink alcohol, then stay out of the liquor stores. Stay off the beer and wine aisle. Stay out of the bar. That's easy. Like what does setting it aside mean? It means don't expose yourself unnecessarily to the temptation. Like it's stupid. Stop giving into it. If you struggle with gambling, stay out of the casinos. Stop betting on NFL preseason games. I mean, that's ridiculous. You don't even know who's playing in those games. You know, Broncos favored by two and a half in a Hall of Fame game preseason when starters aren't even playing. You're going to bet on that? you got a problem. Stop betting on games. Stay out of the casinos, right? If you have a problem with pornography, stay out of the dark back room of the house in the middle of the night. 
thinking I can handle this. I'm just searching the internet for something else. The temptations pop up. Stay off of it. You got a problem with gossiping? Stay out of the bunco groups. Y'all, you ladies thought y'all were going to get off this morning, didn't you? Yeah. We've got some bunco groups here at Heritage. Those, I'm not talking about those groups, the other ones. Ours don't do that. They're not heritage sanctioned, by the way. Um, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians to be sober-minded and to stop sinning. As your pastor, I'm telling you I understand and I know the destruction of sin in our lives. Stop. Lay it aside. And, and those, those, those guardrails, those boundaries, those, uh, those things that we put in our lives to, that, that are wise decisions to not unnecessarily expose us to those temptations that we have, those are good. But until we understand and know where the power to overcome those temptations come from, they're only going to be temporary. You're going to turn into a self-help motivational speaker where you're on this hamster wheel of trying to continue to do good and, and keep from doing something and stop doing something until you can stand on the reality that I'm dead to sin, that it has no more power over me in my life, and to walk in newness of life. And, and where does that start? Like, we keep going back. Like, Where is all of this? Where's the source of all of this? I don't want to just treat a symptom. Let, let's go and let's look at where it all starts. Because Paul's pretty clear, and you go through the New Testament, and there's instruction about how we live our lives and, and what that looks like as we walk in newness of life. And uh, look at Romans 13, verse 13. Look at what he says. Let us behave properly, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh in regards to its lust. Where he says, lay aside the old self. You know what they talk about, a habit, changing a habit? If you're familiar with it in any way, you know, in the psychology of it, when, they, when you're trying to, to stop a bad habit, the psychologist always tells you, don't just stop something, replace that habit with something. Paul's saying, lay aside the old self, that old flesh. Stop walking around with the dead flesh in your life and put on Jesus. Put on Jesus. Stop putting on the old flesh that's dead, that causes destruction and chaos in your life. Put on Jesus. He says it this way in Ephesians 4. Put on the new self, same thing which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So we're called to put on Jesus. We're called to put on the new self. We're called to walk in newness of life. Where does that come from? Where, like we just figure out something good to do and do it? If you'll figure out and, and kind of really pay attention when you're reading scripture, so often context and flow and Never does Paul, mo, other writers, but when Paul's talking about being a new creation, it never is it, do you pull out just one passage and say, okay, what does this mean? In my, how do I apply this passage in my life? And, some, and so often it may have happened in your lives and you may have been taught Romans 13, 13, behave properly. So we pull that passage out and we preach messages about behaving properly. So it's behavior modification, right? It's just stop doing something, stop doing something. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then put on Jesus, right? But if you back up in these passages... In Colossians, where he says, put on the new self. In Ephesians, where he says, put on the new self. When you back up, he tells us where the power is. He tells us where this all starts and the source of all this. Ephesians 4, 23, look at what he says. That you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That comma, the very next passage, says put on the, put on the new self. Be renewed in your mind to put on the new self. Romans 13, let us behave properly. Let's back up. Let, let, let's see how he prefaces that statement. Let's go to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Look at what he says. 
I urge you. By what? By what? By, by what? Not by you. Not by anything that you could hope to accomplish and bring before God in order to, to get what we're talking about. Not according to your adequacy. Uh-uh. By the mercies of God. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Here's where it is. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Before he ever even starts talking about putting on the new self, behaving in a certain way, walking in a manner worthy to which we've been called, he tells us that that is the outcome and the outflow of renewing our mind. Because where does the enemy attack you? Guys, if you don't know, you're just going to let it keep happening. Where does the enemy attack you? Thank you. How old are you? We got a seven-year-old that's getting it. I pray she grows up knowing that. Some of y'all are blindsided like, ah, oh, where did that come from? Yeah, I give in to lust. When it's put in front of me, and man, I just started thinking about that, that one girl down the road. Weird. Paul says that we're not ignorant to his schemes. He attacks you in your mind. That's why over and over and over, he says, to renew your mind. Renew your mind. Renew your mind. Renew your mind so that you walk in a manner worthy of your calling. When you renew your mind, then you walk in newness of life. Stop believing the lies of the enemy. Don't allow him to bring doubt into your mind and destroy your confidence in the reality that you are no longer slaves to sin. And don't allow him to instill doubt in your mind and your confidence that you have access to God through Jesus because of your faith in him, not because of anything that you've done. And when you can stand on those truths and those promises, then our lives start to look victorious. We don't have to look around and see the effects of things that are going on in our lives because there's fruit that begins to pop up all over the place because we see the outcomes of being confident and assured in our standing before God and our ability to come to him. And as we put on the new self and walk in newness of life, we become transformed. And in turn, we transform Texarkana. Let's pray. Father, thank you. First of all, God, for who you are. God, that none of this is about us that you ask us simply to believe that we came into relationship through Jesus by faith and according to your mercy. And God, I pray that our eyes are open to the reality of the truth and the promise that you have set us free from being enslaved to sin, that you have made us new and that all you ask us to do is to grow in our understanding and knowledge of who you are and your love for us. And to be able to walk in freedom in your mercies. Father, we thank you and we praise you for being a good father. That loves us more than we could ever ask or imagine. God, I pray that we would become more and more rooted in that love and that our lives would be transformed, and that you would use us to transform this community for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.